Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Baylor University Medical Center. We are so excited today to introduce you to two of our tiniest patients and their mothers. And we do anticipate having lots of different sounds during this. This is the best part of the conference. Um, these are women who have entrusted us to help them expand their families by way of uterus transplantation. So today we're going to hear first from our principal investigator, Dr. Juliana Testa. He'll then pass the mic over so we hear from the mothers themselves. Dr. Lisa Johannesson will conclude. She's the medical director of uterus transplantation here at Baylor University Medical Center. We'll take some questions. And then at the very end, who couldn't have a little birthday party without cake? So we'll ask the clinical trial team to join us for a celebratory photo to be able to welcome our babies into the world. With that, here's Dr. Testa. Um, I, I, so we're not going to talk today. I think today is the, the day of, of the babies, and that they should uh, really uh, say something, um, <laughs> but um, um, we, uh, on, on behalf of the team, on behalf of Baylor, we, we wish uh, Indy Pearl and Emerson the longest and happiest life. We are humbled by having taken a small part in their coming to life, and um, I think that it's a recognition of uh, a lot of work, but most of all, courage from the moms who trusted us when they didn't know where we were going, and uh, we are indebted to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and Lisa, thank you. You have one, right? Yes, I do. You can hear me. Okay, I don't need it. Okay. Oh, oh I see what we're doing. Are you gonna go first? Oh, uh, hi, I'm Peyton, <laughs> and this is Emerson, and um, thank you so much for being here, and we're just really excited and happy to share our story. And I'm Kayla Edwards, and this is Indy Pearl Edwards, and um, I'm just honored to have a platform to be able to share our story. Um, MRK is very special to me. It's something I was diagnosed with, and so um, to speak out for other women born with this condition or just people struggling with infertility in general, it just means a lot to me, and to show her off and show how wonderful and miracle she is is just an honor. I mean, I've, we worked hard, and I'm just in so... I'm not, I feel in debt to these doctors for just taking the chance to research something that I never thought would be researched. So we're just honored to be here and be a part of this. Yeah. I'm not going to say much either. I just wanted to, uh, to congratulate both of you. And uh, uh, one thing you said, Kayla, just before we went in here was that when you were young and you got the diagnosis MRKH, uh, meaning that you were born without the uterus, you didn't know that anyone else was like you. And I think that's why it's so important that you share your story to be inspirational for all those women out there that has the same diagnosis. And they're not alone, and there is hope. Mm -hmm. Of course. But Thank we're happy to take any questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we can maybe say uh, that Emerson was born. When was she born? Uh, she was born June 21st at 11.33 a.m. in the morning, so <laughs> it was very quick and everyone was really tired, but she came into the world and it was the best day of my life and my husband's. Yeah, and she was number three yeah. out of the birth uh, here at Baylor, and then we have Indy Pearl who was number four, number and she's a little bit more recent, right? Yeah, she's, let's see, she's three weeks today. Today's Tuesday. So three weeks ago she was born and she was six pounds, five ounces, 17 <coughs> Three fourth inches and just looked like her daddy when she came out. So definitely his. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't make a mistake. <laughs> we have the IVF team here. They didn't make a mistake. Thanks for putting in the right egg. <laughs> and you can also see how well behaved they are, both of them. <laughs> yes. So I don't know, do you want to share anything about when you got the diagnosis and you, and you heard that you were, had this uterine factor infertility? Yeah. Um, I got diagnosed when I was 15. I had a series of tests, or like an exam, an ultrasound, and an MRI confirmed it. And I was like, Kayla, I didn't, I didn't even know what it was called. It was a few years later before I even found out what I actually had. And I honestly thought I was like the only person in the world born like this. It was really confusing, kind of a dark time in my life, honestly. And um, the older I got, I think the more it came to light that I would never have children. It wasn't at 15. It wasn't like, oh, I can't have kids. It was more of just feeling really weird and not 
normal. And so it all kind of continued to like pile on with age and time. Yeah, and for me, I was diagnosed around the same age. I just never got a menstrual cycle. And so my mom took me in and it was a hard diagnosis at first, but when you're 16, you're not really thinking, oh, I'm gonna not have kids. It kind of something you don't process. But once I met my husband and I realized I wanted to have a family, you just start thinking about that stuff and what your journey is gonna take. And my journey started off hard. It was really hard to figure out, okay, we're 20, we're getting married. Now we have to save tons of money to go through adoption or surrogacy. And it's just really hard to process that. So especially just processing that diagnosis. And then I always felt inside of me that I was gonna fight hard to have a family. And this diagnosis didn't define me. I never thought of like, this is gonna stop me from having a kid. So I always just researched. Like I remember asking my doctor, okay, well you have, you do hysterectomies every single day. Like why can't you put one in? And she laughed at that <laughs> and just said it was very complicated. So from that moment on, I was like, someone has to believe in this. Someone has to research it. And I remember Googling and finding this study and it just became an opportunity I couldn't pass up. Yeah. Any other questions? What has been the hardest with going through uterus transplant? Ooh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all had different yeah. struggles throughout this process. Um, I would say for me, just, well, it started out finding a donor. We moved almost halfway across the country for this opportunity and we left everything. We knew my family and I I've lived in Vancouver, Washington my entire life of 25 years. So when me and my husband, we had just bought a house. We sold our house. We quit our jobs. We packed up a U-Haul and moved down here. And for, I remember sitting on our hospital bed, it was like 50-50 shot that this was going to work. So, um, but my fear has always, my faith has always been stronger than my fear. I even passed that along to my donor, you know, same selfless person sitting on a bed willing to give me a part of her. So I think through all of this, you have to have your faith over your fear of it and, it's been hard. Second hardest part for me was getting pregnant, and she was our last little embryo, and she's a miracle. This is a miracle. I'm <laughs> holding one, so it's pretty awesome. <laughs> um, I would probably say that my pregnancy was the hardest part. It just seemed to be a lot of stress, and I, but in the end, everything worked out, and we got her, and I attribute that to the amazing team that took care of us while I was pregnant. I, I, it's honestly been the best team of doctors and nurses that I could have ever hoped for. And a lot of the times when I was scared, I just remembered who we had on our side and it calmed all of my fears and worries. And we can probably just comment also that both of your donors has been altruistic, meaning that they, you don't know them mm -hmm. and they volunteered to give up their uterus to, to, for you to have this experience with pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yes, And that's been amazing. I mean, I think about her every day and I can't get over the thought of someone just giving like an organ of their body to someone that she doesn't even know. So every time I think about that, I mean, I've thought about her through this whole journey and I've gotten to share my pregnancy and tell her I'm pregnant and, you know, I've heard her response and she's known that I've given birth to her and one day I get to meet her and I get to place a miracle in her hands. So I can't wait for that moment. Do you think you both will meet your donors? I hope so. I hope, yeah. Yeah. I hope to meet. Yeah, for sure. I love her. <laughs> Same. <laughs> so. yeah. These uh, miracles are part of the clinical trial, right? It's very selective. There's a small number of people that get to be a part of it. What is your hope for the next 16-year-old girl who comes in and she's told that she's not going to have a family in five years from now? What do you hope that she can well, uh, first of all, the, the fact that it's true this started and uh, finished as an experimental trial, but uh, we went from a, a rough start to a 90% success. So we are really very confident now that we can offer this to uh, possibly to as many 16-year-olds as, as, as needed. We don't wish anybody to have to go through this, but now that we have... A, a solution we're really happy to say that most of the experiments uh, that we were doing uh, have given us the fruit that we needed. And in this, the, the, one of the things that I think is very important is uh, uh, today we are, we are of course celebrating and we're extremely happy about Emerson and Indy Pearl. There were hundreds of women who stepped forward uh, 
wanting to participate in the trial and wanted to donate a uterus. And, and especially for in the beginning, for, for the, the ones that unfortunately are not here to celebrate with us because they didn't have the same success. To them really goes our, our number, you know, our strongest uh, prayer and thought because that they were uh, instrumental to allow us to come today, to be able to be here today. I think I speak uh, uh, in, on behalf of the entire team. Uh, we have a tremendous respect uh, for, for women in general uh, that have the courage to, to undergo something like this. And, uh, but then when, when this happened, then you feel really, wow, we can really move, move on and, and uh, offer this and, uh, and make sure that we get better and better in doing this. And I think for the first, I mean, the first birth is always fantastic. Uh, but now the more birth we have, the more we show that this is not something that you do in one institution in Europe where it started. This is something that we can actually reproduce. We can do it. We have several babies here now. And this is something that we can offer to, to more women out there. So my hope is that that 16-year-old girl will know that there is options for her if she chooses to become a mother. <coughs> Yeah, and for me, at 16, I didn't have anybody. For the fact that a 16-year-old girl can go on the internet and say uterus transplant and this pops up, that's amazing itself. You don't, I'm part of the MRKH community pretty well, and I get messages every day of just showing, wow, this is happening, wow, I can't believe it. You know, I don't consider myself, an, like I couldn't say I'm an inspiration, but people see it as an inspiration, but I hope she's an inspiration. You know, they get to look at this beautiful miracle and say, wow. And I think the doctors touched on something of, oh, I can't think of that for a second, of just like, it can't stop here with us. Like, this can't, it's just been so successful. And I just, in five years, I hope that a woman can walk into multiple institutions around the United States or the world and be like, can I have a uterus transplant? I was born with one. That would be amazing for them to just have that opportunity. So I think that's so powerful and, you know, this is still experimental, so I hope insurance can listen to our stories or funding or people are inspired enough to continue this for other women because there's so many people struggling with infertility. They've opened up a new door for infertility. That's what the doctors had said. Like, there's more options. I never had this option until now. So, <laughs> is um, uh, it's it's a fairly lengthy process. Um, it's a it's different than any other transplant that we do. Uh, the transplant is not done really for curing a disease uh, in the person who receives the transplant. Transplant. The only real goal of the transplant, the objective, is to have a child. So that in itself is is really a very peculiar way of approaching the the, the, the transplantation issue. Um, there is, of course, a selection of the candidates uh, for both the donation part and the, and the, and the recipient side. Uh, and then there is the um, embryo. Uh, we need to have embryos prior to. It can be done afterwards, but it's much safer and, and better to have the uh, prior to. And then uh, there is the transplant itself. Uh, the donor can be a, a living donor, like uh, it happened uh, with uh, um, Indy Pearl and Emerson, or uh, it can be a diseased donor. So we can go both ways. Uh, then there is the transplant itself. Then we have to wait for the function of the, of the uterus, which is the normal function that every woman experiences. And then after that, there is the implantation of the, of the, of the embryo. If that works, then there is the pregnancy, and finally there is delivery. So the, if everything goes as good as it can, we can probably complete the entire process within a year time. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a lengthy process. Within a year, including pregnancy, or within a year to... to that would be including, including the pregnancy. Yeah, so the first birth we had, we can just mention that she got transplanted and then 14 months after she delivered her baby and the uterus was taken out. So that's, that's how quickly it can go, uh, but it can also be a longer process. So we, 
Uh, and this is just saying that this is the beginning of the field, so we don't know what's going to happen further on. But most of the clinical trials in the world at the moment, they appro are approved for one or two pregnancies if the mother is, uh, can handle the immunosuppression and, and everything well. She's allowed for a second pregnancy. But after that, we take the uterus out. So it's actually the first temporary transplant there is. So, which is great because the mother doesn't have to be on the immunosuppression for the rest of her life. It's just for the pregnancies, deliveries, and then that's it. Um, if I may, um, in the in the audience, uh, there are practically, I would say, almost all members of our team, and. Uh, I, uh, if I might, I would like to recognize our infertility team <laughs> that has been, of course, instrumental in, uh, in giving us the opportunity. Dr. Zeng and Dr. Putman have been absolutely phenomenal throughout this, this process. Uh, Dr. Gambi, Bob Gambi, has been the, the, the pillar of the uh, maternity <laughs> period and uh, has calmed everybody throughout the process, me uh, first, because I'm, I'm the one who knows less than anybody else about <laughs> OBGYN uh, issues. And uh, on the back, we have uh, Christine and Eder. They are the, uh, the so-called uh, nurse coordinators. In, in reality, I think they're angels, and they, they really have kept the communication continuously open day and night, 24-7, with uh, every single donor and recipient. And uh, uh, been the, the one who have bridged all the information to me and, and uh, Dr. Johannesson allowing us to provide the care. There is uh, Joanna Bayer, who is one of my partners in transplant, and uh, she has been up at night, like all of us, when we had to, and uh, also an incredible force in the, in the team. And uh, let me see who's around there. Dr. Greg. Dr. Greg. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Greg has been uh, uh, the, the, the crazy professor in the, in the enterprise. He's the one who has really the know-how and the genetics and allows us to, uh, to think twice about many things that we do. And it's been a delightful experience to work with him. And, uh, and then one thing that usually people say just because they have to say, but there have been uh, no single nurse or ancillary uh, professional in this institution has not been uh, supportive of us. We never felt alone, never once. Even in the worst time, you got only smiles and uh, words of encouragement. And I think that was very phenomenal from the operating room to the intensive care unit to the ward to delivery to radiology to pathology. Everybody has stepped in even over hours just to help us out. And it's been unbelievable as an experience. And then lastly, uh, not because uh, we have to, but because I think I personally feel it, this clearly could have happened anywhere else in the United States. But strange enough or good enough happened at Baylor. So this is very, very important. Uh, there are no many institutions that can really support a program like this with the strength the faith and also the encouragement that we got throughout these uh, years. Since we started with the idea to the last delivery, the institution has been a pillar and uh, something we, we can always go back to and, and, uh, and, and ask and uh, always support, uh, never felt. So it's, it's a really, it's been a, an incredible ride for, for all of us. I think we should be really, I personally am very proud of having work within this, having made this happen uh, at Baylor. Um, so now the members of the clinical trial team, if you'll join us behind the cake, Dr. Testa, if you will help us cut the cake for our babies. And Heather and Kristen, if you could help transport, please. <laughs> Do that safely. Yeah, baby transport. And we'll give the media just a moment to kind of gather around. So we'll go around the back, yeah. It's a lot of pink. Welcome, babies. Yeah. 
So kind of my Dr. Testa in the middle. Do I, I don't want to get oh, the babies in the